And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is Deborah Yates, who during her NDE saw the most beautiful place you could possibly imagine. Deborah, thank you for joining me and welcome. Thank you for having me, Jeff. It's a pleasure. Deborah, I didn't mention this in the beginning, but actually you've had three NDEs and you've been dead twice. And I think it would be best if we just start with the first one and go from there. All right. I think we can do that. Um, before I was even born, my mother had issues carrying me and she took a set of drugs called DES, which were medicines that were formulated to help women not lose their babies. And she had about 13 of those with me. I tried to escape multiple times. And somehow or another, I happened to stay in the womb. I did come out about two months early, which in the 1950s, for a baby of that age to live was rare. Um, I was a four pounder. And generally, it was really hard to have those babies survive it back at that time in that era. And I was actually probably saved by Colonel John Glenn's family. Him and his family had donated an incubator to the hospital that I was born in. And I was the first baby to get used to that incubator. So I, I thank I thank him and his family for, you know, what they did for a poor community. Um, so as you can well imagine, I, I have no recollection of, of that time and space and era in my life. But um, when I was three, um, I was outside playing with some uh, one of the neighborhood kids, and uh, and I don't know what I did, what I said, but I uh, angered him. I believe he was challenged in some way in the brain, and the next thing I knew, he had me down in a um, small like creek type drainage ditch type thing that was full of water, and um, I I recall. Even at that young age, my first memory is at about a year old. I have very good, vivid memories of different spaces and time from a very young age. So what happened was, was I was looking out that water. It was clear. The water was clear. And I remember looking at the sky and thinking, this is the last thing I'm going to ever see. And um, I, I called on the angels. I said, I need an angel. And when I was about to run out of air, all of a sudden it was like something raised me up. I don't know if it was myself that raised me up, if it was the little girl that knocked the boy off of me that raised me up, but I got to live. And when um, I went home, my mom, the first thing she had to say was, I told you not to get dirty. And the other little girl goes, wait, Mrs. Yates, the little boy um, attacked her and she had her held down her head under the water in the ditch. And my next memory is seeing my mother collapse. And uh, she was very heavy pregnant with my little brother at the time. And over the next, you know, probably two months, I didn't see my mother. So what I thought as a little kid was that I killed my mother that day and my baby and, and the baby. And um, and then suddenly there was my mother with a little baby in her arms. So what had happened was I'd gone to live with a relative uh, because she had collapsed and wasn't feeling well after what happened to me when she realized, you know, I almost died. And, um, you know, because I, I was so sad, I kept thinking, I killed my mom and I killed that baby. I killed that baby. So when I saw that baby, that baby, I told everybody that was my baby, it's my baby. And it's not hers, it's mine. But, um, you know, we were close there for a few years. But, you know, in uh, in the eye of a child, I can see how that could have all have run together. But, you know, things happen. And, you know, one time I almost got hit by a car. I was probably about 12. And I don't know what jerked me out of the way, but I'm telling you something pulled me right out of the way of that uh, speeding car. I was probably about 10. So I've had a lot of interesting close calls in my life um, as well. It's like 
sometimes I just can't figure it out. Why me, Lord? Why me? So anyways, I, everything went along pretty good until I was a teenager. And um, I believe I was about 16. I um, got amnesia. And um, I probably was on my way to dying. I had uh, a horrible thing in my head that just wouldn't go away. My head pounded all the time. The doctor didn't know what was wrong with me. I lost my memory. They, you know, got me laid down. And when I woke up, I didn't know where I was again, but at least I knew who I was. And um, they, of course, took me to the hospital once they found my mom. And um, here my sinuses had closed shut and swollen. They were so swollen. So what they figured happened was, was it put pressure on my brain and it just momentarily, for a while, knocked out my memories. And um, so that was interesting. But yeah, I mean, if it hadn't happened the way it did, you know, God only knows what could have happened to me. So that was an interesting experience. And then when I was 17 years old, I was at a party and I was dating the uh, center for Ohio State University and a uh, big tall boy. I mean, like, to me, he looked like he was seven foot tall, but I think he was either six foot 11 or seven foot three, I'm not sure. And everybody was just, you know, having a rousing good time. And I was fixing to walk down a hallway and this thing pops out of nowhere and it looked like a monster and it had monster hands and a monster face and it grabbed me out I went cold out I went well evidently I was a lucky lady they drug me to the center of the room and a, a paramedic that was a paramedic in Vietnam because you know that we're talking the 70s here sad to say well good to say and um you know it's like I'm walking around the room and I'm feeling like I'm walking six feet off the ground and I'm looking down trying to figure out how I'm walking in the air and I still couldn't figure it out and then all of a sudden I see this person on top of another person and they're going like this and beating them beating them in the chest and I'm going whoa what is going on over there and so I watched this for I don't know because the time just it was weird. I, I can't explain what the time was like and the timeline could have been like. I really don't know. And I, I did not ask how long it, that lasted. But um, all of a sudden I seen it was me laying there getting beat on. And I'm just hovering about the ground going, oh, oh, no. I'm thinking, what is going on around here? And I'm like eight feet off the ground, I swear, eight feet off the ground, minimum, six to eight feet. And um, and then the next thing I know, like everything went like whoosh and I'm laying on the ground and I looked up at the guy and I went, what are you doing to me? He was beating on my chest, doing something or other, bringing my heart back to beating. I was gone. I was gone. And it's like, oh my gosh. Let me stop you for one moment. Yeah. You said that a monster grabbed you. Yeah. So um, are you saying it was like an entity or something? It was my boyfriend. Oh, okay. I didn't In a monster mask with monster arms. He was dressed up like a monster. So he basically scared yeah. you out of your body. He scared me to death. He literally scared me to death. I've always had issues um, since I got knocked, knocked from the back. And, and the boy tried to drown me. Um, I like I'm paranoid, I guess. I mean, it it I've had other instances as well. Um, I was kidnapped at uh, 13 by four men and um, they caught me from behind as well. So um, uh, I have issues. 
<laughs> with things coming at me from different directions, needless to say. So, um, you know, it's like, okay, well, I was only 17, so dumb. And nobody like insisted I go to the hospital. So I got no medical care after that one, but I sure was bruised. He bruised the crap out of me. Uh, like from here to here, I was like just massive bruises, but he saved my life. So I didn't care. Did he give you any sort of medical reason what happened to you? Like you fainted or what? No. Oh, I was dead. I didn't faint. I, I, I had no pulse. You know, he checked me for pulse. There was nothing. I mean, that's all I really know. That man is dead. So I can't question him anymore about that. Um, what happened? I don't know. All right. I, don't, it's just, I think you can be scared to death. And if you can be scared to death, I got scared to death that day. Well, I think Literally. I think that someone's coined the term fear death experience. So, yeah. Yeah, I've had a lot of them. I uh, was the first survivor then of uh, what was called toxic shock back in the uh, early 80s. Um, they had no name for it. And then I was laying there just in absolute agony. And I kept asking my doctor, I said, what is wrong with me? What is wrong with me? He says, I don't know what's wrong with you. He says, I've been working with the CDC. I don't know. We don't know what to do. We just know what not to do. And we're trying everything we can. And um, when that episode was all over, uh, he told me I was an hour. I was an hour from death. And, um, you know, he doesn't know. It was the combination of drugs they were using on me. Uh, that saved my life along with the CDC. I mean, I, I get that, but so that is the, literally the first survivor of toxic shock before it even had a name. Now, was that your next NDE after the, after the party or was there something yes. in between? Yes. No, that was, um, was that next. Yeah, that was next. Yeah, that was next. Did you leave your body during that syndrome? You know, I would say if I did anything, it would have been like what they call a astro projection. I know I kept going different places, but I could have been hallucinating as well. I mean, there's no real clear cut thing for me there. I did have an extraordinarily high temperature. So some of those images and things that that I got, you know, I really can't say, you know, it, you're just, it was the most painful thing I've ever experienced in my life. And I've had a lot of painful things happen to me and um, physical painful things. So I would just have to say, I, I don't know. I don't know about that. Okay. What's your next one? The next one is swimming in a swimming pool. I was at, and living in Plano, Texas. And um, I had moved there because my husband tried to kill me. He liked to beat me down to death. I did three weeks in the hospital. And um, I ran away. As soon as I got out of the hospital, I, I booked it to Texas because I had a friend that lived there and um, I thought it was in my best interest to leave. So he didn't, you know, be successful at killing me. And, um, you know, you just, like I said, my life has been filled with these kind of stories. And, um, you know, sometimes I think, you know, I'm an author and I wrote a book about my seventh great grandmother. Her name was Nancy Ward or Nanihi Tiskajiski, whatever you want to call her. She had like so many names in history. Um, and I think that, you know, I met, uh, uh, for lack of a better word, a shaman that told me that I've lived a parallel life with uh, Nancy Ward. And, um, you know, sometimes I think maybe he's, he's, he hit the nail on the head and, you know, it's just, it's overwhelming to think all this, stuff has happened to one person and 
you know, it doesn't end there. It, it, it went on and on. Well, I was electrocuted in a pool in, in, in Plano, Texas, and I should not have survived that. I should not have survived that. I was doing laps and um, I was an avid swimmer and I was on the swim team and the dive team. And, you know, it's just something that I kept up for, you know, health benefits and things. And um, I, you know, come up to take my breath before I did a kick turn and what looked like a megaphone was in the water with wires running in and out of it. Turns out it was the light fixture had come out of the wall, come up to the top of the water, and I came down into it with this part of my hand. It was all severely burnt through this part of my hand and down into my palm and stuff. And I, I, I couldn't let go. You know, it's just shocking me and shocking me and shocking me. And um, the next thing I know, I'm speaking to my grandmother who'd been dead for several years. And, um, you know, she's just telling me that it's not my time yet, that I've got to go back. And I'm telling her, no, I don't want to go back. I want to stay here with you. And as I'm looking around the area, it is like the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. Everything was there that was already there, but the colors were so vibrant and so crisp and so clean, and it smelled clean. It was like you could smell the trees, you could smell the grass, you could like smell or want to almost taste the colors that were around you because everything was so clean and clear. And so I'm talking to her and I'm saying, no, no, I, I want to stay here with you. And she's going, no, you've got things to do. You, you've got to go back. And I could smell her. It's not necessarily that you can like fully full on see their face, but I could see her eyes. Her eyes were there and her smell. I could smell her. You know, everybody's got their own smell. And I could smell her very clearly. And um, it, it was crazy. And then the next thing I know, she goes, go, you, it's time for you to go back. And she moved her hand like this across in front of me. And as she did that, that power shut off on, what, on the, uh, the light thing. And it, it let my hand go and it, my arm rotated all the way around. And when it come back in, I hit the wall and I bounced off the wall about 15 feet backwards in the water. And when I stopped, cause see, I didn't feel anything until I stopped in that water. So it was like over and my whole body Oh my God, it was on fire. I hurt so bad. I, 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 there's no explaining it. I had, you know, of course the burns here. I had burns on my left foot. So evidently like when it goes in, it comes out somewhere else. And um, I knew I was alive and I went, oh crap, I got to get out of this water. And so I'm heading towards the ladder. And just as I was about to reach the ladder, I heard, don't touch the ladder. Clear as day, don't touch that ladder. So I veered off to the side of the ladder. Somehow or another, I was a strong person, especially back then. But somehow or another, I managed to throw myself out of the water, about, waist, about to my waist, landed on that uh, uh, pavement, and... Um, or the, the concrete patio around the pool. And then I inched myself, I, I flattened up and inched myself out of the water and out, away from the water. And there was a man laying in a chair over there suntanning and I'm hollering at him to help me. I said, can you help me? Can you help me? Well, he was sound asleep and come to find out again, 
ear, uh, thingy on and he couldn't hear me. So um, I got up and I just ran in front of me and I grabbed the fence, a wrought iron fence that went all the way around and encased the pool. And I just held onto that fence and me and that fence was just, we was rocking. I mean, I rocked, ended up rocking that whole fence all the way around. I could, you know, kind of see the fence around me. I'm just shaking and shaking. And I could not let, they had to literally, the fire uh, people, the ambulance people, whoever it was, because they took me by ambulance, um, had to literally pry my fingers off of that metal. And I was still shaking. I mean, just racking. So anyways, um, I get to the hospital and, you know, as time goes on, you know, they're checking me out and they got me hooked up to machines, you know, and checking my heart and all this stuff. And here comes doctors. Can I touch you? And I went, okay, sure. Nurses, can I touch you? I'm going, okay. And finally, I looked at my nurse. I said, what's going on here? She goes, oh, you're supposed to be dead. There is absolutely no reason that you should be alive other than, and she just kind of pointed up. And I went, okay. Well, then here comes the maintenance man. The maintenance man. They're going, can we rub you? And what up? <laughs> oh, my God unbelievable i don't know how many people wanted to touch me that day did they think they were touching an angel or I, somehow I getting close know. to god by touching Watch, you I, I i really i don't know i didn't ask them i was just compliant okay <laughs> oh shoot so anyways I, I i i got home i don't know how you know they kept me in the hospital most of the day and making sure that i'm okay and i raised bumps everywhere I mean, I still have a lot of them today, thousands and upon thousands. I raised bumps all over my whole body, my arms, my legs, my face. Um, that, that was how the electricity partially escaped my body was through the pores. Oh, crazy. Plus, I had the hole in my on my foot on the other side. So it's just, yeah, left, right hand, left foot. Big, big burns, huge burns. Um I didn't sleep for a week. I mean, literally, one one whole week, I had no sleep, hardly at all. Every time I would like go to sleep, my body would jerk away. I mean, I might get a minute or two of sleep, and then next thing I know, jerk. Okay, you're awake. Literally, I'm not even kidding. One week I was awake, and um, as that week progressed, I got more sore and more sore and got to the point where I could barely walk and I couldn't move certain ways. I, my body like stiffened up and um, I went to uh, my doctor who was over in uh, Mesquite, Texas. <laughs> and uh, I said, he's, I told him what happened and he goes, you know, yeah, you should be dead. I went, well, I'm not. I said, but I hurt. Unbelievable. I said, every day that goes by, I hurt more and more and more. So he did a spinal check on me and sent me from his office straight to the hospital where I went into traction for three weeks, in and out of traction for three weeks. And then they did electric stimulation on me with the TENS unit. Oh, my God. I thought I would flipping die. The first thing, time that thing hit with the electrical impulses, because I was, they're calling it a TENS pack. I don't know what TENS pack is. Well, they hooked all these little th wires up to me. They hit me with that thing. I screamed and come straight out of that bed, straight out of the bed. I mean, just lost my mind. And so they had to sedate me <laughs> and come in and explain explain what they were doing to me and why they were doing it it's like well you could have gave me a heads up i said y'all know i just got electrocuted i said and this is electrical impulses you're putting into my body well you know after all all that their stuff with in the pool 
I'd always been real sensitive. Um, you know, like the little boy says, I see dead people. Seen dead people since I was, you know, probably, I know for sure my first memory is at five of seeing somebody that wasn't there, but was there, but wasn't there. And um, it was actually my uncle. I, I'm pretty sure I, as I grew older, I saw pictures and I know it was my uncle and uh, our great, great uncle, something like that, that had come to visit me. And um, I never met him, of course, because I was, uh, he was dead before I was born. So I know I never met him, but I met him. And, um, you know, it's, I think that sometimes people are just sensitive. And I believe I might be one of those people that um, are born this way, maybe. That's kind of what I'm thinking. I, I think I was born this way. And I, like, I travel with uh, night lights that have, like, motion sensors on them. You know, they're not really lit up. But when I get movement around me, those lights will go off and I know somebody's there. So I just kindly tell them to walk towards the light. And in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, walk towards the light is what I tell them all. Because I figure they're, most of them have always come to me to be moved on. So now I, I just don't even talk to them anymore. <laughs> just tell them to walk towards the light. You know, there was a time I did do a lot of, you know, talking to them, so to speak. But now what age were now you? I just sent them what age were you again when you had your first one in the creek? I was three. Do you think it's possible? Do you think it's possible that that NDE gave you the ability to see dead people? Because sometimes people people get these gifts afterwards. I I believe so. I, I I don't have a problem with that. It could have been then. It it could have been my birth. My birth was very traumatic, and um, like I said, I I was dying. I mean, I was a little tiny baby, but you know they didn't expect me to live at any juncture. Did the doctors think mom would carry me anywhere near to where she did and anywhere, you know, you know, I don't know. I don't know um, the answer to that question, but I would say, yeah, that's, that's probable. I mean, I'm almost 70 and I've had a lot of time to think about this stuff. So yeah, that's, it's extremely possible. When you saw your grandmother, did you see her, see her clear enough to kind of get an idea of what age she looked like on the other side? Her eyes, that was what I could see. And I would say from the things that I've had happen to me, most spirits that you see are, unless they're little kids, are, and if they were like old people when they died, you see them, I would say, in their late 30s to late 40s, somewhere in that range is, is the age I've seen almost everybody. Very, you don't, I don't see them as old, you know, crotchety people. They're, they're in their new form. How do you see these people? Like clear as day in front of you, or do you have to be like in a trance or something? No, I'm not in a trance. Nope. Um, clear as day on some of them. Now, the spirits that come, like I said earlier, I, I'm pretty sure I'm right about the portal thing. I think that that they know that I'm a portal and that I can send them on and that they seek me out. I mean, I mean, every night I do this probably three to four times every night. And, you know, people have seen these lights go off around me. They know what I'm doing. Um, my, my old friends, you know, that have known me forever. I don't think I, I didn't really let very many people know about what happens to me until I was well published, um, from my book and, um, it slipped out during an interview and, um, it's kind of snowballed from there, so to speak. Um, yeah, some of them you do, it's sometimes you just smell them uh and like sometimes like when i'm discussing something like somebody had somebody die around them and they're seeking answers to questions that they have um somehow or another i will know what happened 
and I'm able to relay that. Sometimes I'll smell things. Sometimes I can hear things. Sometimes I see it. It's always different. It's never just the same. Um, I've been able to do it over the phone with people. Yeah, I, I yeah. He fell backwards out of the truck. It's exactly what happened, man. Well, they've never said that. And I said, well, he did. And you'll be able to figure it out one of these days. You will get the right paperwork that will show you what happened to your son. And so, you know, it's like, it's always something. But I don't do anything to make no money. I, I, God said, no, uh, -uh. you can't make money off of this. Um, you know, I know a lot of people d do, you know, in different various ways, but that's, I'm not allowed to do that. Nowhere near it. Do you think these people are walking around outside of their body like you were when you were six feet above your body at the party? I, I do. They're here. Heaven is here. It's not some far off distant planet or in the sky. It's it's here. It, it is here. That's what I saw. I know I saw heaven that day, um, especially the one at the pool. You know, I mean, it was I think the one uh, when the the basketball player scared me to death. I think that was more of a lesson to be learned to me to understand the gift that I had. And what was going on around me that I couldn't understand. Um, maybe that was a something that was allowed to happen to me or made to happen to me so that I'd have a better understanding of what these folks are going through on the other side or not going through. You know, I believe we're on different planes and, you know, if you, whatever you want to call that dimensions, you know, you know, some folks can probably relate that, you know, sometimes you see things, you know, out of the corner of your eye, you know, like that will something's there, but you don't know what it was. I believe that you're seeing the other dimension when that happens. And like, yeah, that you're seeing the other dimensions that are there. Do you think it's possible that your body glows or something from the other side and that's how they spot you? No, I think they just know. I think they just know. They know who we are, I would say. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, it's like I met this man. His name is Arthur Bohannon. And they call him Dr. Bones. An author is not only an author, but he is the the man that opened up uh, remains to put bodies in like to just like like to 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 put them so they can study when bugs come like for people that they find you know dead in the desert or or dead in the hills or wherever and so author set all these graveyards up all around the world so that they could study the body's decomposition and what happens to the body as it decomposes, what bugs come when it decomposes, depending on the time of year, you know, yada, yada. There's just, you know, more to it than I can ever explain. He worked on the Challenger, which is quite odd because I saw that blow up about two weeks before it blew up. And I told my friend, I said, this 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 spaceship's going to blow up. And she goes, well, what are you going to do? I said, what do you mean? What am I going to do? I said, I'm not going to do nothing. I said, I can't call NASA and go, this this space this space thing is going to blow up, okay? I can't do that. And she goes, why not? And I said, well, because they tried to abduct me once before, and maybe even twice. And they tried to put me in a think tank. They tried to put me in a study group um, to just to study my ESP, for lack of a better word. Because my I got one girlfriend and I, psh, we can like, we can literally communicate and have been able to do this for a very very now it's decades but when they tried to study us we were both right around 19 20 21 years old and it was at a college tried to get us in this program and they approached me multiple multiple times 
wanting to get me in this study group. And I'm going, no, because my inner being and my spirits or spirits that are around me said, mm -mm, no, you don't do that, ma'am. You don't do that. No, nope, no, nope, no. Nope. Because I, I was afraid that they would, they would figure out that I see things, hear things, know things, and that they would keep me, you know? I don't know if that was just a craziness in my mind thinking, but you know, you watch these movies nowadays and you just don't know. You don't, you don't know. The government followed me for a long time. I, I knew, I knew president Kennedy was going to die. I told the class that Kennedy was going to, that Kennedy was dead. And um, I was in the first grade. I was a baby. I, I was just a baby. I said, Oh no, he's dead. And my teacher goes, Oh, Deborah, no, he's not either. Well, let me tell you, when he died, they came and got my butt out of class. And I went to the office for, I don't know how long, hours, hours, hours. I was questioned by the dang gun police and people in suits. Well, from that time on, they followed me. I believe all the way through high school, they followed me. And because um, I would see them. And sometimes they would sit me down, pull me out of class and talk to me. Why aren't you getting better grades? You're a genius, you know. I said, well, maybe did you think that if I don't get good grades, that maybe you'll leave me alone. <laughs> That's what I told him the last time I, that they actually pulled me out of class and talked to me. I was in the eighth grade. And, um, you know, I just have a big distrust of, of them. I do. I, I do. I don't know if it's my nativeness, uh, that, that spirit works through me. I don't know if it's the creator that, that says no. But I listen now. I, I listen to what my spidey sense says if, if i got a bad feeling about you you know you're gonna look at my trail and you're not gonna see me I, I'm, I'm not gonna mess with you I've, I've had been you know i had people try to kill me multiple times for no good reason i'm a decent human being i've always you know never understood why anybody would want me dead there is no nothing in any realm that can prepare you for somebody wanting you dead, nothing. And I've been through, I've, honey, I've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars in therapy, years in therapy, therapy five days a week for six months in a row because I wanted to check out. I so wanted to check out. I, I don't, you know, when you don't understand, you can't understand what you don't know. And not many people can understand me because they don't go through the crap that I've been through. And, um, but anyways, yeah. Uh, uh, where do we go from here? I don't know. You mentioned that you wrote a book about your grandmother. Yes. What's the title of that and what's it about? My book is about my seventh great grandmother. Her name was Nancy Ward. Um, her, her white name was Nancy Ward. Uh, one of her nicknames or whatever, she was good gay you. She was a beloved woman. Uh, she was Nanyahi, uh, Tistagiski. Uh, there's probably about, about 10 more other names and titles that she had. Uh, she was Alaska gay you, which does mean beloved woman in Cherokee. It's what gay you means. And uh, the Cherokee Nation before the removal of the Cherokee and the tribes of the the northeast before they were sent to to beautiful Oklahoma, and um, she actually predicted the Trail of Tears, and um, I believe they took the expression Trail of Tears from her from her prediction about what would happen, and and my grandfather would always say, she said, I see my people walking in a line with tears streaming down their face. And um, most of our family removed is what would be called old settlers. And that means you voluntarily removed yourself before the actual rounding up and herding them off like they were scum and cattle across the United States during the winter. Oh, let's take barefooted women and children and march them up through Tennessee and Kentucky in December and January. Who does this? Who does this? Oh, they didn't do it so we would have a good time or that we weren't set out for success out there. You know, we we just weren't. 
Now, I, I have feelings about all that. I, 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 I hate to call it anger. It's not anger. It's, you know, understand what you did to a group of people. There is nothing. There's no repar repar reparations that anybody can make to make up for the lives of our people. There just isn't. I mean, they they damn near destroyed us. They damn near exterminated us. And trust me, I, I, I believe that's what they wanted. And oh, by the way, we paid for that. We paid for that. They took money from us. They say they bought that land for us. They didn't. Yeah. Have you had any other NDEs? Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, I have, actually. I I dang near died. Um, let's see what year would that have been. I want to say it was the early 90s, like 91. I, 91 and 93, both times. One time was more serious than the other. I have allergic reaction to um, antibiotics. And um, I, I barely made it. I mean, the ambulance driver, I heard the ambulance driver say, oh no, your blood pressure is 269 over something. He goes, we're not gonna make it to the hospital. They've got to meet us, they've got to meet us. Cause I lived in the rural area and my workplace had called an ambulance for me. Cause you know, when you're in the middle of dying, <laughs> You just don't know what you're going to think. And um, they called an ambulance for me. They did come. They picked me up and uh, threw me in the ambulance and started heading toward town. And um, yeah, yeah, it, it, that was that was no fun. It, it took me weeks to get over that. Um, and then it happened again two years later. And then it happened to me in Vegas. I, oh, and it happened to me in uh, Mexico and Canada. So I don't leave the country no more because I've had too many strange things happen to me. And it's mostly like allergic reactions to food, medicines. It's crazy. I had to eat five Benadryl because I was out in the country once and there was just nothing I could do. I had to eat five Benadryls to save my life. And uh, thank goodness they invented those gel ones, the little gel caps, because you pierce them and squirt them straight in it goes like straight in your bloodstream. So remember that if you ever have one. And you've got the liquid Benadryl, use it, bust it open though, don't swallow it. If we get back to your book for a moment, didn't yeah. your grandmother help you write it? Oh, I think she wrote it, period, dot. Uh, most of, I'd say 80% of it she wrote. Um, yeah, yeah, it was an interesting experience from beginning to end. I had so many miraculous, wonderful, interesting things happen writing it before I wrote it, while I was doing the research, after I wrote it. Um, it's just been one blessing pretty much after another with that. Um, the lady, I, I wrote everything out on by hand. Uh, I'm, I'm not good with this computer stuff. And uh, even though I used to be at one time, I got a mental thing about it. I had a vision that this computer stuff was going to ruin our world. And I was actually writing computer programs when I got that. And I went to work and I quit. He says, you can't quit. I said, I can quit. And I'm quitting and I'm done today. He goes, why? And I said, because this is going to ruin our world. I said, anonymity over. Nobody will be able to hide from nothing. It's going to ruin our world. So I did. I quit and I started working with animals. I said, you know, I just can't be part of this. I, I cannot be a part of this. And after I had the, the vision and I seen what was going to happen. So, um, yeah. But anyways, Nancy Ward was very sensitive. She was um, very in tune with the spiritual world. I, she had um, the, the gift of sight, foresight, uh, precognition, whatever you want to call that. She knew things that she shouldn't know. Um, they, her birth was actually predicted amongst the Cherokee that there would be a, a, a girl child born from the wolf clan, which were wolf clan that will rise to lead her people to greatness. And, um, when my grandmother was born, um, it was cold outside, but you had to bathe every day in our culture. And, um, 
So her grandmother took her to the river to bathe her. And as she was bathing her, a white wolf appeared on the on the on the on the bank above them. And and that at that point, the grandmother that was bathing the baby said, This is this is this is the sign, this is the child we've been waiting on. So her her grandfather was Matoy, who was considered by King George II the emperor of America, because that was like the late 1600s, early 1700s, and we didn't have a ruling government at that juncture. So he tried to get my great grand, my grand, great grandpa to come over to meet him. And he wasn't stupid. He wasn't going to go. So he invited George to come here, King George to come here. Well, he said, no, go figure. And um, so what he did was he sent um, two of his sons to go over there to see where all these people were coming from and what that was like. So they took a little trip across the ocean on a ship called the Fox and uh, dined with the King of England. And one of my uncles fell in love with the lady in waiting to King George II's wife. And she came back with them as his wife. And um, so we have a lot of connections to the European world as well. And when they came home, they said, this is never going to stop. There's more people there than 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 there are trees in a forest. So I believe that through that insight of of that traveling, you know, they they garnered a lot of information and knew that we couldn't beat them, and that they would just keep sending more and more and more and more people here to abscound with our 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 furs, our meat, our trees, our our gold, our silver, our copper, you know, whatever they wanted. And so um, the uh, Lucy Ward was her name, the the man that married Oconestoa, uh, the woman that married my uncle's, he was a, the war chief. And um, her one ended up being the war chief and the other was the, um, the, the peace chief. So one was white and one was red. And you know, people, you know, said, well, what is it about Nancy? I said, well, you know, she, they go, well, you know, she killed people. And I said, yeah, I, I do know she killed people. I said, but what you have to do is we have to recognize to understand the path to, to the white path. You've got to experience the red path, especially when like every breath you took was danger. I mean, we don't know what it was like to live in the 17 and 1800s. It was a crap show. You know, I mean, we had the Spanish, the English, the Portuguese, uh, possibly the Vikings, or probably the Vikings, the English, the French, all within a 50-year span was trying to take everything, was trying to, you know, claim this land as their own. And we're going, yo, this is our land. We've been here forever. You know, God created us and put us here to take care of these lands. What are you talking about? You can't have our, our land. Nobody can own the land because there is no ownership of the land. It's just here for us to use. And God, the creator put us here, God, whatever you want to call them, creators, what they call them, to take care of this land and these animals and all that's around us. So, you know, as, you know, the wise human beings we've come these days, you know, you have to see the your beauty and the simple truth. And um, I believe that the Native Americans in America, you know, once we again can take our rightful place with respect, I believe this country is bound to walk a path that is mostly red. And that's exactly what we've done. Deborah. They put they put us somewhere where we couldn't do nothing, you know, killed us took our freedoms away from us, told us we weren't allowed to speak our language, put our kids in their school where they beat them, starved them for speaking our own language. Excuse me. Okay, well, you thought you killed it all out. Guess what? You didn't. You didn't. 
it still survives today. And thank God we had the code talkers, the Apache code talkers, and all those guys that were able to speak those languages that nobody else understood because, oh, guess what? They were forbidden to speak on. Well, what you couldn't do was come in our teepee and always hear what we were telling our children. But, um, you know, praise praise God for that. But, you know, as human beings, we, we got a long way to go. And, you know, I, I believe that the people in the spaceships are angels. I do believe that. I, I, I believe that that's who they are. You know, if, if God was going to send them here from another realm or, or whoever it is, what do you think he zapped them here? Like they're there. Well, they had to get here somehow. Why not in a spaceship? And I've seen plenty of those as well. I believe it's all in a different dimension. Those ships come and go from a different dimension. That's all. They've learned how to work those dimensions. I believe that's who Bigfoot is. I believe Bigfoot comes through the portal, through a dimension. And I've seen Bigfoot. So why is it I'm so lucky to get to see and hear all this stuff? I have no earthly idea. I know when I'm really gone, I'll find out. But until then, you know, I just have to believe that, that the creator, that God had a purpose for me. And that's the reason that I have survived every time somebody's tried to take my life. My last husband's girlfriend tried to kill me. It's like, really? What am I doing wrong? What am I doing wrong that this stuff continually, continually keeps happening to me? Oh, it might make a good book. Well, let me tell you, I haven't been able to write that book. It's too terrifying. You know, I, I, I literally couldn't remember but one or two or three things at a time for most of my life. I couldn't put it all together and formulate it like boom, 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 boom. Here, this is how it goes. Now I can now because I've been through EMDR. I've been through all this counseling and had all these wise people help me put this stuff into perspective as good as I can to keep alive. I tried to kill myself multiple times. I'm horrible at suicide. A failure, a complete failure. And I have to know that his hand was in that too. But the hurt, pain, sometimes it's hard to, you just can't see past it. You cannot see past that pain that just takes you, you know, like somebody is like twisting a knife in your heart and it's that pain's never going to go away. That's what people that kill themselves are feeling. They are so hurt and so wounded, they cannot see past it and that that feeling is ever going to lift from them. So it's easier to just go, okay, bye. And, um, you know, I'm not proud of that, but it's the truth. People say, oh, why would you say that? I say, you want me to lie? I can't lie. If I'm telling the story, I've got to just go ahead and tell the story. This is what happened to me. This is what I see. This is what I believe. And this is what I know. And um, I just pray that people that are listening to my story and listen to other people's story, that they don't, you know, just go, my God, really? You know, which, yeah, I can see where you say that because you don't understand what you've never experienced. You know, I even do that. I am a sensitive medium, whatever you want to call it, psychic, whatever you want to call that. And sometimes I'll be watching something and go, yeah, all right. So I understand <laughs> where that comes from. But, um, and then you go, oh, well, you do the same thing. So why would you even doubt for two seconds that that other person can do that? I believe as the, as, as the world as we know it is fixing to change. I personally can't see any, I've had no revelations of anything past 2025. I have no idea why. I've not been given any information as to why that is. The only thing I can come up with is maybe I'm not here after 2025. That's what I've leaned towards. But maybe it's because it's all fixing to change. I really don't know the answer to that. And I've asked myself many, many times because I've known this for a very long time. Very, very long time. Now, the title of your book is Woman of Many Names. Should they... If they want to learn more about it, should they go to a website or Amazon? Um, you can go to www.woman of many names and order the book straight from the publisher. Um, you can go to Amazon. I think I'm at a five star on there. If not, I'm four and a half because of one bad review. 
And that's because that person got a hold of the first printing, which went out without the corrections in it somehow or another when they had the right one. Somebody hit the wrong button. Just saying. So, oh, the punctuation is horrible. Okay, misspelled words. Okay, well, I never claim to be a scholar in that respect. I, I'm a smart person, but I'll, I'll learn to learn to spell with phonics. And trust me, it's the worst way to spell because you're listening. And words don't always get spelled that way. So that's that's my story. I'm sticking to it. Well, after watching this podcast, people may want to reach out to you and ask you questions. Are you open okay. to that? Uh, sure. Sure. Um, you can pop. I'm on Facebook, of course, and you can, you know, probably use Messenger to get a hold of me there. Um, I don't know if I should give out my email address or not. I think Facebook's enough. Okay, there we go. Yeah, Debra Yates, Facebook. Um, yeah, that'll work. And I looked about like this then, so it's got my picture on there. Before we wrap it up, can you leave us with one last positive message? Yeah, I think I could probably do that. You know, um, I've told most of my story here today, and I want people to know there there is something after this um i don't know if everybody will be on the same exact realm or get to go the same place everybody goes to sometimes i wonder about that um if you believe in heaven you believe in hell um and that may all just be the way it goes but people in pain hold on just hold on for one more day Hold on for one more day and, and seek the help that you that you need. There's no shame in getting help. Trust me, I've spent a lot of money doing it. There are free things out there that that, that are available for folks that, that feel like they're just, they're done. But God can wait on you. The creator can wait on you. Try to get some healing first. Just try. Just try. It's worth, it's worth it. Definitely. And I'm glad... I got saved, you know, and I was saved uh, at six years old. I, I was baptized, youngest person baptized into the uh, Baptist faith at six. And uh, they decided I'd reached the age of accountability. I knew things I shouldn't know. I'd never read the Bible and I could answer all their questions. So that comes from somewhere. It comes from the creator, it comes from God, Jesus, Jehovah, whoever, or Buddha, whoever you decide that you believe in. I believe they're the same fellow. Believe they're the same fellow. Deborah, thank you for your message and thank you for being my guest. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.